It's Thursday and we're getting everyone together to go and visit the brewer that we grow the hops for. You got the sun behind you, so you, you look awesome. But... I'm the brewer and owner of the company. Started in 2014. We're going to do a brewery tour and uh, see how uh, how we do it uh, here in uh, Sunne. It was built as a hospital uh, back in 1948, and we're going to get inside the old kitchen. It was used uh, up to 2004, and then it was closed for 10 years before I started to hire the place. Let's go inside. So th this is where all the good stuff ends up before it gets uh, uh, out to, to System Lagers and the restaurants and bars. So uh, the brand uh, is Friken, the lake here. And we use um, uh, oats as a special grain for, for uh, brewing the beer. So does anyone know uh, what, what, you, what things you use in brewing beer? Well. You get the spent grains, right, from me? <laughs> um, that's actually malt, it looks like this. I'm sure most of you know about it. It's, uh, I don't know the English name for the grain. Uh, okay. Barley, mm -hmm. yeah, malted mm -hmm. barley, that's right. Uh, so it's barley that has been steeped, uh, put in uh, water for a couple of days and then roasted. And the different roasts of the barley makes the color of the beer. We can actually ha have a taste of it. It tastes quite good. Uh, the sweetness of uh, the malt makes uh, is the sugar that the yeast later uses mm. to produce alcohol, uh, carbon dioxide, and uh, other flavors. And these are the oats we're using. It's called black oats. <laughs> so we have a local mill uh, a couple of miles uh, north of the Sunna, that's roasting the oats before milling it to uh, a nice flour. You can just smell it. The, the, it's a lot of fiber, so you don't have to eat it. <laughs> so we use the oats as a spice to the beer. So up to 20% of the, the grain bill is uh, the roasted oats. Except for the malted barley and oats, we of course use water, local water and uh, yeast, of course, and last but not least, uh, hops. hops, that's what you're growing. This is a South African uh, hops, actually. And uh, regarding the hops, uh, uh, we try to be as local as we can in getting uh, the ingredients. Uh, the malted barley comes from both Sweden and Finland and the hops is growing in Germany, of course, in Great Britain, uh, especially England, United States, Australia and in New Zealand. Back in the days, uh, Sweden had a, a lot of hops. The greater farms had to grow hops for the state or for the military because they used hops, of course, in beer. Uh, especially out on sea, uh, because beer had uh, it didn't went bad as water could be, uh, go uh, when they were kegged. There's a lot of stainless steel here, <laughs> yeah. so it lo most breweries uh, looks uh, look like this. A lot of tanks, uh, stainless steel tanks that is used for different purposes. The heart of the brewery, uh, brewery is uh, this uh, brewing pot. So this is where we heat the, the water. It's about uh, 1,250 liters. Uh, it's used for heating up water to about 65 to 75 centigrade. We will pump it up to this tub where we have put malted barley. So when we put the warm, warm water and um, mold together, it makes a syrup. A syrup, right, yeah, like a thick syrup. 
And during uh, this process, where the warm water meets the malt, uh, enzymes from the malt uh, breaks down the starch in the malt to, and produces uh, sugar. Mostly maltose uh, is the primary sugar produced, but also fructose and sucrose. Uh, and this uh, chemical process takes about an hour, and then we pour it back to uh, the, the pot. Uh, so the grains will stay there, and that's the grains you will receive later during the day. Uh, but the, the syrup, uh, or the wort, is now being uh, poured into the pot, and then reheated up to the boiling point, so it will, we will boil it. And during the boiling process we uh, put in hops, so the hops um, will uh, contribute with uh, the bittering. We the this is the old hospital mall. Good. It now makes beer. Uh, we used the yellow one uh, when we started. Sorry. Uh, we have two uh, different uh, mills here. The yellow one was the first one we used. Uh, but it was quite loud. So we have a um, childcare um, uh, service uh, <laughs> upstairs. So we couldn't uh, crush the grains during the day. We had to do it early morning or uh, late in the afternoon or night. But then we bought uh, this uh, one from Germany. It's quite quiet and it's very efficient. We have cold water in here and hot work in there. And the cold water will chill, chill the, the work. How long does it take for a thousand liters? Uh, it takes about 45 minutes to chill it down. It's the perfect time. To That's very efficient. And a good pump with it. So, and uh, quite a good pressure in uh, the water system as well. In the old system that we uh, still are using is one of these tanks uh, back there. These are milk tanks with a chiller in the back. And we use them for fermenting in an open system. So the last day of fermenting, uh, or the last day of the fermentation process, we transfer the beer to a closed tank, one of the tanks you, uh, you saw in the corridor there. Uh, and by the fermentation process takes about a week from five to 10 days. Uh, the ideal fermentation time would be five or six days because then we can use uh, the tank or the whole system once a week. But with these tanks we can uh, we use them for beer that ha uh, should ferment uh, for a longer time and uh, should be lagering for, uh, lagered for a longer time or stored. Uh, because during the lagering or uh, storage time, it also matures, so it gets its uh, final flavors uh, during the maturing uh, process. Uh, it could be about, for, for one of the beers, it, the maturing uh, process takes only one week, and for the more heavy beers, uh, like the porter in the third tank here, it could take a couple of months before it's ready for consumption. How many how many kilos do you use in one year currently? Do you think? Uh, let's see if we can count on it. About fifty-five. Uh, about two hundred fifty, three hundred kilos. And you think we could possibly supply that? Uh, with three hundred uh, plants. Uh, in, be in, best in case, good conditions. Yeah. 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 Uh, the, uh, uh, down in uh, Germany and uh, Czech, Czech Republic, uh, you can you can get uh, about two two and a half kilos per per plant. So maybe uh, the season but, is shorter. Isn't yeah, it? but here you could uh, hit for a kilo or something like that. At the best. Ah, it'd be super sweet if we can supply yeah. all that. Yeah. We'll see about it. And th that's the dried hops. Uh, all the valves here, uh, magnetic valves, uh, is uh, controlled by different uh, time settings. 
when we start filling the beer, we also open the exit valve. And uh, when the beer is coming up uh, to the end of the bottle, or the top of the bottle, uh, we cut off the beer supply and uh, keep the exit valve open. And the pressure will zero in about a second. And it's uh, equal to when you open a bottle, so it just produces a little foam. But most important, uh, the beer will not form, uh, f produces foam during the filling process. Uh, labelings. Would you be willing to say what you've invested in this? Yeah, uh, from the start, four hundred thousand in equipment, That's and uh, uh, yeah, and uh, for six or eight months higher as well. Um, and uh, during the last two or three years, two year, two and a half years, I've invested about five hundred thousand more. About uh, five to six hundred thousand grams. That's very reasonable, no? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know other breweries, uh, even here in Värmland, that uh, started out with three or four million crowns. Is that because you're buying a lot of second-hand yeah, equipment? Yeah, and yeah. doing it uh, by yourself. Christian just went to the toilet, so I'm just testing everything. That was really cool, and thanks, Christian, for sharing us around. What I really appreciate about Christian's attitude in business is he's really trying to support local enterprise through his own business and having us grow hops for example uh, if we can get 350 plants together and get them cropping well then we can supply his entire hops demand but he's also been having meetings with the agricultural boards lrf to try and establish a malting business in vamland so that all the um, ingredients for the beer can come from Vermland, which would be awesome. We love to, to work with other innovative producers who are trying to create change in their fields. And I also really inspired that all that stainless steel and equipment and chillers, etc., it's a very low startup, about $100,000 to start the business up, which surprised me a lot. In Sweden, for all that gear, you know, it's a lot of expense that you could easily spend four or five times that if you didn't take the time to source all that material secondhand and used. And he found things a lot cheaper from the milk industry. Uh, a lot of milk farmers going out of business here in Sweden regularly because of the monopoly in the milk market. A uh, big problem with the commodity market. And one of the great things about small microbreweries is that there's a monopoly on alcohol in Sweden. You can only buy alcohol above 3.5% from the system Belag, it is the government regulated shops. But if you're a small producer, they have to supply your beer. You have the right to have it in front of customers. So it, it works really well for innovative small organic producers like this. I'm off into the forest to get the ATV fixed at Arnie's place. He's an awesome guy who knows everything about these machines. I moved in here 43 years ago. So and he built use, this uh, whole place. I don't know if you heard on the camera, he, he bought this farm for 3,000 euros and built everything here with his own hands. Beautiful buildings, really nice yard, and he's got an amazing workshop. But he's done everything in the old fashioned ways with the old building techniques and old materials. He's just showing us his sawn here that he built. Four centimeters from the beginning, yeah. and now it's almost. How long did you say you? When when did you buy it for three thousand euros? Uh, back in uh, seventy eight. Three thousand euros or three thousand crowns? Three thousand euros. Yeah. yeah, amazing. And you put a lot of work into. I had no road. It wasn't even a road <laughs> to get here. And I had, no, I had no houses around. I have built all the houses myself. So it turns out that we have a totally bent 
Uh, parking brake disc. The parking brake is a separate disc here and it's totally bent out of shape because some people have been driving it with a handbrake on which is one of those things that having lots of people sometimes costs a lot of money. And also this switch that does the diff and four-wheel drive doesn't open. And Arnie, in how many years have you been fixing bikes, Arnie? 30. 30 years and how many... Four wheelers, 30 years and bikes, 40 maybe. And how many of these have you changed? 12,000. No, this uh, ah, unit. And, and, no, one. He's never changed one of these no, before. No, never. It never happened. So this is the cost of having peeps. <laughs> but that's the way it goes. This is Arne's new bike. He loves riding as well as fixing things. He's fixed thousands of machines and he's known locally as the best repairman going. And I love his workshop. It's super compact, but everything in here for fixing up everything you could possibly do to for quad bikes, snowmobiles, motorbikes, four wheel drives. And he's just an awesome guy also. We just really love coming. He lived in California for some years. So he likes speaking English with us and he likes showing people around his property when we come and fix up the bike. And he does special uh, winter spikes for quad bikes because obviously it's quite icy here, which he does with this cool tool over here. It just opens up the, you drill a hole in the tire and it opens it up and pops in the spike. So he likes making these. How old is this one? Six years yeah. uh, hard riding. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, gives it the top performance. It's dinosaur. Whose nest is that, Gracie? I don't know. It's some water bird, but they are quite big eggs. You think it's seagull? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to drive into the forest to our friend who's a welder where we bought the peacocks and we're putting extra racking on the slaughter racks because uh, we're going to be processing nearly double the chickens per day this year and we managed to knock these together using a normal welder that's not designed for stainless steel but he's got all the gear and is a much better welder and so we thought we'd give him the job. So I'm off to the forest, crazy we're taking you to mama's. You can say goodbye to me, so monkey. This is our friend's place where the peacocks came from. And we're just dropping off these racks. We're just welding in 20 mil box tube in two extra pieces in each bar to put up the capacity to a couple of hundred chickens. Well, I've been driving around a lot today and seeing different people and just feeling really inspired by the local community. There's so many skillful people, so many helpful people. And I'm really interested in the idea of bringing back villages and communities to life, not in any alternative community sense, but getting the basic interactions and businesses and, you know, respectful relating and communication and simple things like a farm is the basis of a community in my mind. Once you have a farm in place producing really epic quality food, then people want to start opening restaurants with that food. Then people want to start moving there. And, you know, when there's kids around, people want to start thinking about alternatives to schooling, etc. And, and for me, this is really where, you know, food is the thing that connects us all. We all eat food all the time. And we all need good, healthy, local, poison-free food. So... I'm really blessed to be in this part of the world and whilst it's not exactly the, the sort of hub for agriculture in Europe, it's amazing what you can do at such high latitude in the short growing season. And I'm just really inspired to find more and more people each year who are interested in this thing. It's really growing in Sweden. We're a bit behind other countries with these kind of movements, but it's growing a lot right now and it's becoming really popular in in you know regular people's minds so really excited for these next few years and and collaborations i'm going to make a video about the new rico ring that's something we're going to be working with as one of the admins on the facebook page it's a new 
hub for producers and consumers to connect, all done via Facebook and pre-sales, which is kind of what we're doing anyway, but it allows a lot more producers to get involved and do drop-off points that we've been trying to get other producers to use our drop-off points that we've been working on. But this is a much more evened out way to do it where we're not responsible, it's actually the consumers that will start administrating the page. So I'm going to do a whole video about that as that kicks off in June. It's a very exciting time. That's it for today folks, restful day here and we've got a few restful days before everything gets really busy here next week. Thanks for watching our videos as always, really appreciate your time and your comments etc. You can find out a lot more in our book, Making Small Farms Work, on the website etc. And looking forward to filming the course coming up and we're going to be releasing our online trainings in multiple formats later this year so that people of all levels of income and experience can